week one of the NFL preseason games in the novels, all right? If you listen or watch no other pieces of content throughout the entire summer but these Monday recap videos, which I will be doing every Monday, so make sure you subscribe, you will be you will be double-cheeked up for your fantasy draft coming up later August, early September, all right? So I'm going to be here every single Monday just recapping the biggest player movements in my rankings, up, down, taking them out completely, moving them into the rankings completely, and just the biggest takeaways from the preseason games. And here's how this is going to work. I'm going to try to lay out as much good quality information, cut out the noise to you guys as I possibly can. We talk about snap counts. We talk about routes run. We talk about goal line situations as it pertains to players with the starting roster. I'm going to do that for you guys. I'm going to let you make up your mind. You're going to go into the comments and tell me that uh, it doesn't matter because it's preseason and then we're both just going to go about our day. OK, so maybe you appreciate it. Maybe you don't. What I appreciated in this particular week one of NFL preseason and these categories, I think the way we're going to do this, we're going to talk about rookies. We're talking about all the injuries that happened and then how it's moved players up and down my rankings. We're going to talk about committees in both wide receiver rooms and running back rooms that we got a little bit of clarity on. Uh, guys that have been added to my rankings, guys that have been taken out, things that I'm having second thoughts on that I thought I knew about during the spring, things that have now been confirmed, my priors that I had going into the week, all right? So we're going to break that down. We'll put timestamps down below. And if you look at the timestamps and you have skipped the introduction, you are officially a rude person. Shout out to you. But you know it was not rude? The performances of all of the rookie quarterbacks this weekend. I'm talking about Caleb to Jaden to Drake to Michael Penix, the GOAT to Bo Nix, to J.J. McCarthy, not a single one of them looked overwhelmed. Not a, not a single one of them felt misplaced or had disappointing performances, right? They range from, you know, fantastic down to not so fantastic. But I will say Caleb Williams blew my fucking top off. He played as well as you could have expected him to for the number one overall pick with all the hype in his first preseason games, okay? The way I do my preseason recaps or the way I do my research for these videos, maybe you care, maybe you don't give a shit, is I will go back, thanks, uh, shout out to NFL Game Pass, and rewatch every single game in which the starters are on the field. So I will watch all the snaps of that. I will get my information. I will get my opinions. And then I will go do research on who was playing on specific snaps and routes and all that kind of stuff and combine them together and then yap to you about it. I watched Caleb Williams and I was blown away. I thought they used him so well, you know, any early down, first and second down, anytime that they were asking him to pass the ball, they would put him into play action, let him use his legs, let him use his athleticism, playmaking ability, strong arm, and holy, he just looked like the quarterback that he was in college, the one that we hyped up as being one of the best prospects of the last 10 years. And uh, I would just be really excited about Caleb Williams. Jaden Daniels played well. Uh, Drake, Drake May, I would actually say, probably had the least inspiring performance, but they didn't really ask him to do much. He handed the ball off a couple times through a screen. He did airmail one, but they didn't play him much. So there wasn't a big takeaway here. Michael Penix had his share of good plays and bad plays. JJ McCarthy, I was really impressed with. He's not someone I had been down on. I wasn't in the camp of like, there's no way he could be a good NFL quarterback, but he simply made every throw that he should make, right? What happens with a lot of rookie quarterbacks is like, they come onto the field, they get happy feet where I thought Bo Nix really had happy feet the beginning of his uh, stint playing for the Broncos this weekend. Like, he was looking to run every single play. You could tell he was never really settled into the pocket. He eventually got more more calm and started making some good throws and stopped airmailing the ball. But it felt like of any of the QBs that played, Bo Nix felt probably the most pressure, looked the most nervous on the field for the start of it. But with J.J. McCarthy, he came in there and when there was an open receiver, he hit the open receiver. When it was a shot downfield, he took the shot downfield. He did not play conservatively. He did not uh, play nervously. He did not overthrow receivers that he should not have overthrown like JJ really impressed me and if he keeps playing this way he might be starting week one and it's giving me both him and Darnold Darnold look like relatively good too uh he airmailed a couple passes but he was also not afraid to take shots I would say that having these guys play this well got me excited for the weapons around them right it's made me it's made me more secure with a dude like Justin Jefferson it's made me more secure you know I, I talked a lot about Rashi Rice in the last version of this video that I did which I'll link down below just guys skyrocketing up my rankings based on training camp stuff but again we'll be doing this after each week so make sure you subscribe uh, in the same vein that like Rashi Rice the closer we get to the season the less likely a suspension is for him Jordan Addison is an interesting situation because his trial date got moved to like mid-October and if it's like if the NFL is not going to do anything with him before the season starts I don't know if we see like any sort of punishment from them after 
the October trial date until maybe the next off season. Uh, there's also a chance that it gets pushed again where it's like October, it's like now late December, and then it just keeps kind of moving down. So with the quarterback confidence I have in Minnesota, just how, how comfortable they looked in the offense, I am moving Jordan Addison pretty, pretty steadily up my rankings with each day and week that passes and there's been no discipline we're going to jump back to the to the rookie quarterbacks and talk about their weapons and the running backs behind them because i think all those teams had committees that we're trying to figure out a little bit more from but i want to i want to go into the injuries right now that i think are really impactful to fantasy football we have hollywood brown suffers this uh sc shoulder dislocation now it's a it's a pretty serious injury at least like in the moment and as it happens in terms of return timetable it's pretty wide. It can go anywhere from like three to six, even up to like nine weeks. Now, this is something that like you have to go to the hospital for. You have to get taken care of immediately. And so the reports were you know, pretty overwhelming. This actually happened to Tyreek Hill. If you guys remember, I think it was week one or week two back in 2019, where he was like rushed to the hospital and people were like really nervous about it. Tyreek Hill ended up missing four weeks and then returned to play and was fine for the rest of the season. So with Andy Reid confirming it was an SC joint sprain, the timeline for the injury, again, is typically four to six weeks. Some recent players with similar injuries. Uh, Jake Kumaro had this, missed 12 weeks. John Ross missed nine weeks. Tyreek Hill missed four weeks. Jalen Hurts missed two weeks. So it's really going to be a case-by-case -case basis. Does this move Hollywood down my rankings? For sure, if he misses time, if he misses week one, week two. The other thing to note here with that is the Chiefs play the first game of the season. So they play that Thursday night game on September 5th, which is, you know, in a timetable like this, a tight timetable where he's trying to get back in exactly four weeks to get ready for week one, those extra three to four days could be the difference of him not playing in week one. So Hollywood's going to move slightly down my rankings. Xavier Worthies has got to move up, right? Because at this point, Rashi Rice, the suspension still could be there. Maybe not. But if he misses time, if Hollywood misses time, uh, then Xavier Worthy obviously gets a little bit more play time. So if we dive into the Chiefs offense per se, we only got one drive out of uh, Patrick Mahomes. It was six snaps. What we can glean from it, right? The uh, Isaiah Pacheco hype train this offseason was that he could be a bell cow. And uh, he played all six of the snaps with Patrick Mahomes, which, you know, is obviously a good thing as it relates to the receivers. Hollywood played one snap before getting hurt. Rashi Rice played all six of the snaps with Patrick Mahomes. Uh, when Hollywood went out, Sky Moore came in. And Sky Moore actually outsnapped Xavier Worthy five to four. So it seems like Sky Moore might be the next guy in line to take some outside snaps or Worthy takes some inside snaps and vice versa. And they move around. And I'm sure that's something that they're going to do. They've kind of always deployed a, a wide receiver room by committee, which is why I'm not getting overly high in Xavier Worthy, because Hollywood's also going to come back, you know, within, you know, one, two or three weeks of the opening season. And then it becomes more of a, a little bit of a jumbled mess. So in terms of snap counts, again, Pacheco, 100 percent of the snaps, uh, Worthy, Rice and Sky Moore all played a pretty significant amount with Patrick Mahomes' limited sample size. And if you guys are interested in more of like the actual snaps and routes run and all those kind of numbers, they are in my game by game recap write ups. I'll do this every single week. I'll make this video, obviously, but I do more in depth write ups that talk about route placement and snaps taken with the starters for every single team and every single game throughout the preseason, which is in our draft guide. That article is live right now. It goes immediately out the day after all the games are played. So you can go get the draft guide at bdge.co. But the least expensive way to get it, the cheapest way to get it, very, very heavily discounted, is by going to Underdog Fantasy, the app, downloading it, using code BDGE. When you deposit $10, that's it, $10 or more, using code BDGE, you're going to get a deposit match on it. You're going to get uh, a free square of Lamar Jackson, 0.5 passing yards for week one, and you'll get the draft guide access email to you, all right? So if you really want to stay on top of shit that's happening in the preseason and get ready for your drafts, this is the place to do it. Other recent injuries, I will say I've moved Christian McCaffrey with his calf strain. I'm not overly concerned about it, but it does elevate his re-injury risk uh, throughout like the first six weeks of the season. So C-Mac has actually moved down from my number one overall pick through the top tier of wide receivers. So he's more of like an early mid round, first round pick for me. Next impactful injury is Marshawn Lloyd suffered a hamstring strain in the Packers preseason game. And this is big because there's been a lot of talk of Marshawn Lloyd, you know, kind of forcing a committee with Josh Jacobs being that explosive playmaker. And hamstring strains can linger, especially middle of August. So Lloyd has dropped significantly down my rankings with him probably missing a few weeks, if not into the season. It's something, again, has a really high re-injury risk for players, especially of his explosive nature. So Josh Jacobs was a guy that I was relatively low on 
that I've now moved back up my rankings. Because if Marshawn Lloyd is out, A.J. Dillon ain't forcing a fucking committee there. He's not being the passing down back. Josh Jacobs is going to back his way into a relatively significant target share in the running back room. So Jacobs has went from like my RB 13 up to I think my RB 11 or 10 at this point with what I expect to be like an extra 10 to 12 percent in just overall opportunity share in that backfield. And lastly, I think y'all can comment down below if I missed any other big injuries, but Malik Neighbors is supposedly dealing with a foot or ankle injury. All the reports are that it's a very minor ankle sprain, so I'm not worried about this at all. Let's jump into some uh, wide receiver rooms we're a little bit flustered with. They got a little bit of a committee going on, and I want to backtrack to the Chicago Bears because we could look at both the running back room and the wide receiver rooms. So with Caleb Williams, we got two full drives out of him. We got a 20 snap sample size with this, you know, it's almost like one third of the game. A lot of times you're running like 60, 65 plays as an offense. So we got a, a pretty, pretty nice sample size here. And the way that the wide receiver room shook out, DJ Moore, and Keenan Allen both played 17 out of the 20 snaps. So you're talking about 85%. When they were in two wide receiver sets, it was Moore and Keenan Allen. When they went to 11 personnel, that's when Rome came on the field, which was 11 out of 20 snaps, all right? So you're talking about a 55, 56% player for Rome. He moved to the outside, Keenan moved into the slot. When they played one wide receiver set, so 13 personnel, it was DJ Moore out there by himself. So Moore is the one. As it stands right now, Keenan Allen is the two. I don't think this should be a surprise to anybody. It would have been way more surprising if Keenan Allen was the third receiver on the field. They are the veterans. This is the first preseason game, so I'm not going to you know, lose my mind here. I don't think anyone expected Rome to come out here and win the wide receiver one or two role. Uh, I'm still very much on board with the second half of the year breakout for a dude like Rome. I, I think they'll play a ton of three wide receiver sets, but it is worth noting that DJ Moore is the one. Keenan Allen right now is the two in 12 personnel. It is going to be those two at least for the time being. Now, the running back situation, this shit was this shit was wonky. DeAndre Swift started the game, got the first snap and the first carry, immediately taken out of the game for Khalil Herbert. Khalil Herbert came in. Khalil Herbert got a lot of play time, played a lot of the snaps with Caleb Williams. And part of me was like, all right, they just wanted to get DeAndre Swift on the field and then take him off the field. But Khalil Herbert came in, got some carries. Then DeAndre Swift came in, caught a, a nice screen pass, took it for like 40 yards. And, and that's fine and dandy. I'm not really looking at stats in the preseason games. I don't really care how you perform against team second and third string players because you don't you never know who's on the field for the defense. If you remember last year, Kenny Pickett was like the preseason MVP favorite pick because he torched like the third and fourth string Atlanta Falcons secondary who are already basically a third string team by themselves when their starting roster is fucking out there. So don't worry about stats in the preseason. What you want to look for is usage because – Coaches are trying to see what their starting lineup looks like, all right? So when they're putting players out there with the starting quarterback, it's because that's the team that they want to field when the actual regular season starts. So Swift caught that ball, and then Khalil Herbert was back in the game. This team had three carries within the red zone, one carry within the 10-yard line, and all three of them went to Khalil Herbert. And what's probably most concerning is that on third downs, third and long passing situations, Travis Homer came in as the third down back. Travis Homer played in Seattle. Their new OC, Shane Waldron, was the Seattle offensive coordinator. He came over with him. And Shane Waldron always used a third down back, a pass catching back in the Seattle offense. And that worries me. Do I think Travis Homer is going to put up numbers or stats? No. But is is it looking like he's going to be really fucking annoying to this backfield? Yes. So despite Swift busting out a huge, you know, 40 yard play in the passing game, it's nice. Right. And that's not surprising because he's an explosive player. Uh, this made me feel pretty good about my take that I've had on Swift all offseason is that we don't know who's getting the carries inside the 10 and 5 yard line looks like Khalil Herbert we don't know what this rotation is going to look like we don't know uh, how much dumping off Caleb Williams is going to do we don't know who's going to play the pass down role I thought for sure it'd be Swift but if Travis Homer is now you know making a uh, push into this committee even if it's 15 percent of the snaps that is 15 percent fewer snaps that both Khalil Herbert and DeAndre Swift are getting so again draft with caution when you're drafting DeAndre Swift we can move to the next rookie QB, and that is Jaden Daniels. Now, Jaden Daniels connected on a really nice deep ball to Deami Brown. You love to see that because that's kind of his specialty coming out of college was that nice soft touch down the field. He did run in a touchdown as well, which is sure to just spike his ADP. Here's what I will say as it relates to Jaden Daniels 
and his fantasy reality, okay? They had a great first drive where they were moving the ball and throwing it downfield and having rushing success and scored a rushing touchdown. That's probably not going to be the reality of the Washington Commanders when the regular season started. They played against the Jets. The Jets didn't play a single starter really on either side of the ball, so you were not getting a starting defense against you. Here's the other thing. Jaden Daniels' rushing touchdown came after multiple red zone rushes from Brian Robinson and Austin Eckler, multiple rushes within the 10 yard line for both Brian Robinson and Austin Eckler, a rush inside the five yard line for those guys. And then only after those like six or seven attempts at getting into the end zone, did they use Jaden and Daniels. So it felt a little bit more like a last case scenario. I think the scary part about it is like, is Jaden Daniels going to be more Josh Allen or Jalen Hurts on the goal line? Or is he going to be Lamar Jackson? Because most people don't realize this, but the Ravens do not use Lamar Jackson inside the five, inside the three, inside the two as it relates to rushing. He has almost annually about five attempts inside the five yard line. They they do not want him in that scrum. They don't want him getting hurt. If Washington takes that type of mentality, it's going to hurt his rushing touchdown upside. Now, again, like I said, he scored here, but I, I would not just look at the box score because B-Rob and Eckler were both significantly involved on this drive in the red zone, in the 10 zone, and inside the five-yard line before they ended up going to Jaden Daniels. Now, that backfield was, was a clear split, and here's how I'm walking away from this weekend. There are three backfields that are very, very, very clearly going to use a 55-45 committee. That is this Washington backfield, B-Rob and Austin Eckler. That is Pittsburgh, Najee Harris, and Jalen Warren. And that is the Tennessee Titans between Tony Pollard and Tajay Spears. All three of those offenses are going to use both running backs to a very heavy degree. And there isn't really a player within either of those backfields that I think are bad picks in fantasy, to be honest with you. Like Tony Pollard outsnapped Tajay Spears 8-6. to six. They were both running the ball. Tony Pollard got... Uh, more carries inside the red zone. Uh, both of them were involved in the passing game. I think that offense is going to run through their running backs. As it relates to Pittsburgh, Najee Harris outsnapped Jalen Warren 6-5. to five. He looked good. He was catching passes, as was Jalen Warren. Again, I think that running, uh, that offense, I think, is going to move through their running backs. And then Washington, B-Rob is for sure the player that I'd rather have. I think he's going to be the goal line guy. I think he's going to catch a decent amount of passes. But Eckler is going to be involved in passing situations, too. I don't see a world where any of those backfields end up being like a clear workhorse bell cow alpha. I think all of them have multiple talented players where all of them will have multiple players touch the ball double digit times per game. And I think I'd throw Cincinnati in there as well. Uh, Zach Moss didn't play. Chase Brown took every single snap with Joe Burrow. I think it was like 11 or 13 snaps. So he saw 100% of them, which is good because it tells you that they trust Brown staying on the field in third down situations and blocking for Burrow. What I will say though, as as uh, excited as I am about Brown and where his draft capital is right now, like 10th, 11th, 12th round, and he's a really high upside player because his explosiveness and his athleticism, he does for sure have that DeAndre Swift, Miles Sanders, Trey Benson, Jalen Wright type of gameplay where he's not a great, like, he doesn't have great vision. There are times where he bounces plays where he can't read the right hole. And I think that will keep Zach Moss on the field. Um, so as much as I like Brown because his upside comes from like explosive plays, I would I would be hesitant to say I see him ever getting like a 75 to 80 percent snap share because he he makes a lot of those plays where like, again, and I've said this a lot, DeAndre Swift and Miles Sanders, because they're so explosive, sometimes that can be masked in really good offenses behind a really good offensive line and you could put together a really big year, but typically that shit plays itself out. Like you're not, you know, one of the the half decades best running backs because you're not consistently putting up monster years for a three year span. You can have a big year and then have a terrible year. We've seen that with Miles Sanders. We've seen Swift's crazy inconsistency. That happens a lot with guys that have trouble reading holes. And I think Chase Brown probably falls into that. Doesn't mean he can't have a big year this year, but let's talk about some of the wide receiver rooms. Start with Green Bay, and uh, this one's fun because depending on how much you watched of it, depending on if you're just looking at the box score, depending on if you even just want to choose to take anything away from here, because Jordan Love played one drive, which was three snaps that ended in a 65-yard touchdown to Dontavian Wicks. Now, Dontavian Wicks was the fourth receiver on the field. That was the single snap that he played, okay? Romeo Dobbs was the only receiver in this room that played all three snaps with Jordan Love. Christian Watson and Jane Reed both played two of the three snaps. So I don't know that we really got a great takeaway. What most fantasy players want is to say that Dontavian Wicks is so talented that he's just going to force his way onto the field over these other receivers. He keeps making plays like this. That could certainly be true, but we need more of a sample size of the playtime of all these guys together. They all make me nervous because I don't know 
how often they're all going to be on the field. Again, I've said this before. I don't love taking any of these guys earlier, you know, fifth, sixth, seventh round in drafts because I think they're all going to play 60 to 70 percent of the snap. So great play. Great throw by Love. Wicks is a fucking beast, but I think all these guys are going to play a lot, and I think they like all of them a lot. So don't look at the box score, see Wicks, 65-yard touchdown, and be like, yep, he's their wide receiver one now. Seattle. There's a lot of projection of Jackson Smith and Jigba being this massive breakout candidate for this year, and I'm not necessarily avoiding him. Lockett and Metcalf did not play in this one. Jackson Smith and Jigba ran pretty deep into the game with the backups. He played every snap with the starters there, even in 12 personnel when there's two wide receivers on the outside. He didn't play in those sets whatsoever. They kept him on the field in this one. Again, Lockett and Metcalf weren't playing, so like take that as you will. I, I don't know. I don't know that it's a great sign for me. If you feel like JSN is going to be a massive part of your offense this year, are you throwing him out in these preseason games with all the backups? Like there's no Kenneth Walker, Zach Charbonnet played, but he was yanked just after a single series while JSN continued to play. So, you know, no, no like hard stance here, but I think it's worth noting. Okay. While everybody's like, yep, he's for sure the best Ohio State wide receiver of the last five years. He's probably like number fucking 17 on the goddamn list by the time this year is over with it. All right. How you doing? We talked about Chicago. Let's talk about Buffalo a little bit. And like I've said, all these in-depth write-ups, all these numbers that I'm kind of yapping to right now for every single team is in the draft guide, bdge.co or underdog fantasy app. Download, use code BDGE. Buffalo, we got a couple drives out of Josh Allen. They actually played the entire first quarter, which somehow only amounted to eight offensive snaps. But of the eight offensive snaps, there were three players that played all eight of them. James Cook, Dalton Kincaid, Keon Coleman. Those three skill players played 100% of the snaps that Allen did. Now, this is a great sign for Keon Coleman, obviously. I will need to see it again in week two to, to really confirm that he's like the wide receiver one here before I anoint him there in Buffalo. Um, but behind him, it was a mix of Khalil Shakir getting five snaps, Curtis Samuel and MVS both getting four snaps. They all mixed in with the starters. Good to see Kincaid getting all eight snaps while Dawson Knox also played four or five of them, right? Because I think there's been concern that Knox is still going to be that annoying guy that makes Kincaid play only like 60, 70 percent of the snaps. And it was great to see James Cook play in the red zone on third downs the entire first quarter with Josh Allen. So Nice to see a, a small sample side of a very condensed offense. For the Jaguars, we got nine snaps and two drives out of Trevor Lawrence. Now people are going to freak out and say like, oh, Christian Kirk only played seven snaps. He was on the sideline in two wide receiver sets. Uh, Gabe Davis and Brian Thomas Jr. actually played pretty much all the snaps. I think they played nine of nine snaps with T-Law, which is a great sign for Brian Thomas Jr. Because I think a lot of the you know camp reports out of Jacksonville this summer were that like, oh, he's kind of like the, the four on the depth chart right now. We don't know how much he's going to play out of the gate. But if they're using Kirk in the slot, BTJ and Gabe Davis on the outside, I still find it very fucking hard to believe that Christian Kirk won't actually be on the field for 85 to 90 percent of the snaps. This exact same thing happened last offseason. And you can make the argument that Christian Kirk only played played in two wide receiver sets because Zay Jones ended up getting hurt. But like, I don't think that's kind of a fluky uh, straw man argument. If we're being honest here, it, Christian Kirk is coming back from a, a serious groin injury. So maybe they just don't want him out there for hundred percent of the snaps in the preseason. Some other quick hitting notes that I think are worth yapping about. The Saints got two drives. Uh, Alvin Kamara was on the field for six of the nine snaps while Jamal Williams picked up the other three. Now Williams was used on third downs and in passing situations. And I think it's just something to be conscious of because Alvin Kamara had such a high opportunity share last year and his just overall volume, not efficient, but a ton of volume led to him being a really good fantasy player. The contract that they gave Jamal Williams told us that they wanted to use him, but Jamal Williams could not stay healthy for anything last year. So I think if Jamal Williams can stay healthy, he's probably going to be a bigger thorn in the side of Kamara owners than we actually typically thought about previously so Kamara I would be hesitant to move him up rankings outside of just full full PPR leagues shifting over to another uh backfield Sean Payton parallel is the Broncos here all right Bo Nix played after Jared Stidham I'm not really worried about the wide receivers there's no one I want to draft in that room Javonta Williams played nine of the 12 snaps with the starters and um Samaja Piran came in on third and longs Samaja Piran played the other three snaps. He ran three routes. He had an abysmal drop that led to an interception. There were reports all summer that P. Ryan would be a surprise cut for the Broncos, and I still think that's very much on the table despite what the starter snaps are telling us. It, it's kind of weird to really glean what's going on in Denver because Stidham started, 
and play 12 snaps. But even when Bo Nix came on, you could tell that they wanted their start, uh, some of their starters to stay onto the field so he can get those reps. Like Cortland Sutton remained on the field with Bo Nix for a series or two. So I don't feel like it's a sure thing that Samaji Pirine is the RB2 in this backfield because Julian McLaughlin came in and played really well with Bo Nix. And wouldn't surprise me if next week in preseason week two, it's Javonta Williams and then Jaleel McLaughlin. And for what it's worth, again, I don't really look at stats or try to like be like, oh, he looked so good in this one. Uh, Javante looked good. He looked a lot better than last year. He looked strong. He looked explosive. It's still a bad offense that probably won't present him a lot of scoring opportunities. There is likely to be some sort of pass catching back that supplants him on third downs and third and longs in those kind of situations, whether it's P. Ryan or Jaleel. So I think his ceiling is a little bit capped just based on the situation. But I think Javante is probably a pretty good value outside of damn near like out, out of the top 100 picks right now in underdog. We're going to jump back to the uh, Texans game real quick. So CJ Stroud was on the field for Two series is only amounted to six snaps, but very much like Chicago, we're trying to figure out the pecking order here. And like Chicago, they gave the veterans the starter treatment. So Nico Collins and Stefan Diggs were the receivers running in two wide receiver sets. Uh, they ran six plays. Four of them were three wide receiver sets. So Tank Dell obviously came on as a third wide receiver in those sets. And then Stefan Diggs moved into the slot. So in two wide receiver sets, it was Nico and it was Diggs. When they brought Tank on the field, Tank stayed on the outside. Diggs came into the slot. Now, obviously, everyone saw the big Tank Dell touchdown, and that's going to get everyone excited. And it's possible that Tank Dell is the best receiver in this group. I think it's Nico. It's possible that CJ Stroud likes Tank Dell more than he likes any other receiver on this team. It's also possible that Tank Dell runs the third most snaps behind Nico Collins and Stefan Diggs. And Vegas right now has Nico's season long line at 1050. Diggs is at 975 and Tank's at 825. So they are also expecting Tank to be the third wide receiver in this pecking order. Tank could be the crazy outlier here. I just think it's worth giving you guys the numbers and the information. And then you yell at me in the comments that I'm wrong and and that's fine. I don't I don't really give a shit. So some players that I've moved up in my rankings just, you know, slightly. Uh, Tyrone Tracy is definitely the RB2 in New York, and I think he's going to make some noise this year. Braylon Allen is the RB2 in New York, and I think he's going to make some noise this year behind Brees Hall. I think he is a really, really, really good handcuff pick if you take Brees Hall early on. Uh, same thing with Jordan Mason as it relates to C-Mac. Jordan Mason seems to be the clear RB2 in this 49ers offense and will have a very large role if C-Mac's calf acts up. Some dudes I've just completely taken out of my uh, rankings are second year Quentin Johnston. He is just running so far down the depth chart. I don't think there's any hope for that man. Uh, I've also taken that same team, taken out Kamani Vidal of my top like 200 because he is a sixth round rookie pick that we've all gotten excited about, but he has not practiced really at all this entire offseason. If you're a sixth round pick, uh, you need to be in camp like blowing the fuck up, right? You need to like be making plays consistently for them to want to keep you on the roster. So as I've been saying since May, March, whatever, he's an exciting prospect, but he has just a good of chance of getting cut from the roster as he does being a breakout player this year in fantasy. I've also taken Kendra Miller just completely out of my ranking. So those are some of the low hanging fruits that have just, you know, and that's it. We're almost at 35 minutes of yap, and so I try to keep these videos relatively low volume, but they will be coming out high volume every single Monday after every single preseason week, all right? Like I said, if you're not subscribed, these videos themselves are worth subscribing to, okay? Every Monday after the games are done, you'll have a video like this in your face hole. If you don't want to watch the video, if you want to save yourself 30 minutes and you just want to read the write-ups and get the most important information right there in front of you on your screen, the draft guide is the place to be, all right? We've got all of our rankings updated real-time, live-time, uh, after these preseason, preseason games, they have been updated in the draft guide right now, uh, plus all the write-ups, all right? So that's going to be it for today. I love you. Smokies.